To be a modern socialist country in 2049, prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful, and ambitious goal set by the Communist Party of China. What is the essence of this goal? What does each term foreshadow? What impact will it all have on the world? Institutions, development models, multiple risks. What are the long-term challenges? And what about unexpected events or sudden problems? How to deal with uncertainty, especially over three decades? There are no easy answers, but the questions are vital. Watch our special series on Closer to China, China 2049, Opportunities and Challenges. After four decades of historic development, China's economy must transition from high rate of growth, driven by low-cost manufacturing, to high quality of growth, driven by innovation. Enterprises today must pay workers higher salaries, which requires higher gross margins, which requires innovation in products and services. How to spur innovation, which comes almost entirely from the private sector. Here's the problem. Because China's financial system is skewed heavily to banks, and bank loans are skewed heavily to state-owned enterprises, private companies, small and medium-sized companies, face a financing deficit. How then to transform the financial system to support private companies? What can banks do differently? Is financial technology, fintech companies, the solution? What about shadow banking? And globally, how will transforming China's financial system affect international financial markets? We explore financial innovation and financial risk to be closer to China. After a more than two month long difficult battle against COVID-19, the epidemic in China has been initially contained, though with economic losses, of course. According to the China Passenger Car Association, car sales in February stood at only 250,000. That's close to an 80% drop compared to the same period last year. A number that's largely attributed to the epidemic, experts say, and not very indicative of the long term. It's basically people cannot go to the toy stores. They cannot really purchase the cars. Many dealerships are fighting to survive the short-term blow. In Shanghai, the Lu Jiaxue Financial District, exemplifying district governments, offered a more than 850,000 U.S. dollar rental waiver to two Porsche dealerships. Well, is a help in order to make it possible that our dealerships are well run. On the other hand, brands are innovating to try to boost sales. By the end of February, over 15,000 automotive dealerships, which cover more than 80 brands, had joined the online virtual showrooms on Auto Home, one of China's biggest car websites. Many brands are doing the same on their official channels. Now with the outbreak, we see that there is a very strong demand from customers as well as from our dealers to move online, to move digital. Online channels of car brands used to be more about advertising. Now, Chinese auto group Geely says they are taking internet-based services to the next level, a car key delivered by drone to Geely's new customers. From when you pick a car, make reservations, to when you apply for insurance and mortgages, they take care of the whole service chain. Some experts remain skeptical about the appeal of moving the entire car buying process online. But the outbreak of COVID-19 has prompted car brands to divert more resources to digital channels to improve customer experiences. I speak with Professor Bert Hoffman, former World Bank Country Director for China. How would you evaluate China's current economy? What's the impact of the novel coronavirus pneumonia, NCP, or COVID-19 on China's economy, both short-term and long-term? Uh, increasingly, the, the now pandemic, um, uh, WHO has just declared a pandemic, um, is going to be an economic challenge around the world. In China, we, we expect the, the first quarter to be very 
bad for the economy, in part because China had to stop, almost stop the economy and contain a lot of people at home, close businesses in order to contain the virus. They've done well, uh, but still the economy is not back to its old activity level, so and supply constraints are still there in China. I think those co supply constraints will resolve themselves in the second quarter, but now a big risk comes from the demand constraints from the rest of the world, because the rest of the world is now going into a phase that China almost came out. They were quite late to start, and so the, the infections in some countries are quite out of control, and the measures means that, that means that the measures to, to control the virus will have to be quite severe as well. That will have economic consequences. As the COVID-19 outbreak sweeps the globe, many countries are concerned about their shortages of medical supplies. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration says that over 70% of their active pharmaceutical ingredients used in drugs for the U.S. market are manufactured overseas, 13% of which are from China. The FDA is keenly aware that the outbreak will likely affect the medical product supply chain, including potential disruptions to supply or shortages of critical medical products in the U.S. Azathioprine is a key API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, for making anti-tumor drugs. Zhejiang-based Chung Yi Pharmaceutical is the world's largest azathioprine supplier, as well as exporter of other antiviral drugs. Recently, global drug makers are inquiring about their supplies. Due to the epidemic, orders for our antiviral drugs have grown from zero last year to two tons this month. Most API orders have resumed and kept almost the same levels as last year. The World Health Organization estimates that China accounts for 20% of the global output of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Also, as the world's largest vitamin producer and as exporter of many other key medical devices, China had suspended most production due to the epidemic, but now factories are gradually returning to normal. Since mid-February, Zhao's company has taken measures to ensure employee health and stable production. Now, he says, more needs to be done to boost exports. Recently, we have purchased more raw materials and kept them in our warehouse. We need to prepare in advance for more potential export orders. Presently, countries outside China face increasing challenges from the epidemic. Chinese manufacturers say all they can do now is guarantee production, keep promises, and fulfill their responsibilities to global customers. How would the resumption of businesses in China impact the world? Well, the good thing is that, that gradually uh, uh, things return to normal. They're not yet normal in China, but that things return to normal. And, and that is enormously important also for other countries, that a lot of the supply constraints that started to emerge because people were waiting for parts from China to put into their own production, that that will be alleviated. Second, uh, and I see that more happening in the second, especially the third quarter, once demand from China uh, 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 comes up again, that's also good for countries uh, around the region, countries around the world. The people that sell to China, uh, uh, be it commodities or final goods, uh, demand from China is very important, and having that back up to normal is going to be very critical. Uh, third, and I think that is, that is something that will be increasingly important, as China, China's infection levels is going to zero, it will be enormously important to use China's capacity in medical equipment and medical supplies for the rest of the world, because China is the only one that has that capacity. On March 13th, the People's Bank of China, PBOC, announced reserve requirement ratio RRR cuts by 0.5 to one full percentage point for qualified banks and an additional one full percentage point RRR cut for qualified joint stock banks. In total, the PBOC will release 550 billion yuan of liquidity, that's just under 80 billion U.S. dollars, to support the real economy. 
taking effect on March 16th. How would this measure help the economy and in particular help small and medium-sized enterprises? Well, what, what China is trying to do and what is, what is relevant for other countries as well, they're now going into the, into the, into the epidemic, is to keep companies alive. It's, they're going to be affected by the closed down measures, and, and, and they were, as, as they were in China, they were affected by the closed down measures. Their cash inflow basically collapsed, and at the same time, they still had to pay the rent, they still had to pay the bills, and, and, so, and they still had to pay the, their loans back to, 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 to banks. Facilitating that, and that's, those are the targeted measures that China has taken, is very important to keep companies alive, to make sure that people have jobs, to make sure that there is supply, that the supply chains don't fall apart because some links in the supply chain have gone bankrupt. And I think uh, uh, China has done well there. Other countries will need this, this same type of measures as well. Beyond that, the question is, okay, how much more general stimulus measures does China want to implement? And that depends on whether they still want to try and achieve old growth targets or whether they, uh, as, as and when the, the, the National People's Congress happens, whether the, the government would want to present somewhat more modest growth targets. Coming up next, the battle against the novel coronavirus is waged from hospitals to the real economy. How to achieve high quality growth in context of black swan events and gray rhino problems? I speak with Professor Huang Yi Ping, Deputy Dean, National School of Development, Peking University. China's not the low-cost producer anymore, that China has to have more uh, high-quality growth. We hear terms like innovation society. So, mm. so what is it about China's economy that needs in innovation in order to affect transformation? Well, if you look at from the surface, you find the two things um, that is happening after the global financial crisis. On the one hand, growth has been decelerating since 2020 when GDP growth was still above 10%. Uh, in 2019, we probably had a number slightly above 6%. Some people feel that the downward pressure is probably still here, although the government is trying to um, adopt some counter-cyclical measures. The second thing that is also important is that the productivity is also on the way down. Um, so, for instance, one measure I always look at is called the incremental capital output ratio, which basically measures how many units of capital you need to produce one unit of GDP. The number was 3.5 in 2007, and now it's above 6, which means capital efficiency is also declining. Mm. If we combine these two things together, uh, you could argue that maybe we are entering a new phase of economic development. Whatever we've done in the past the successfully might not be able to continue, mm. and we needed to do things differently. That, I think, is why uh, we're looking, at, uh, looking for some new growth models. Be the uh, elements of such new growth models. In the past, um, the cost level is relatively low. Um, when China started the economic reform in 1978, its GDP per capita was 230 US dollars. Mm. That's below the World Bank's definition of a poverty line. Mm, right. But now the cost is so high, GDP per capita in 2019 was probably slightly above 10,000 US dollars. Yeah. That's high mid-income country. The cost level is very high, so this is why during the last 10 years we are seeing a lot of manufacturing companies falling apart because the cost just, just increased so many times. You have to be successful, you have to do something new. And that is the reason why innovation becomes more important. Even prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus epidemic, China's economy was feeling pressures such as losing its low-cost advantage, its aging population, and growing resistance to globalization in some countries. In this context, how can China achieve high-quality growth? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the, the virus, the coronavirus outbreak hasn't really changed that, but it did highlight one thing, that um, 
has been on the agenda in China for quite a while, but especially since the 19th Party Congress, that, that's governance. Um, I mean, there's many elements that go into, into, into a more productive, more innovation-driven economy, and it, it includes the enterprise reforms, financial sector reforms, it includes uh, 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 better intellectual property rights, it includes uh, 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 world-class universities, better education, that, uh, primary and secondary education that, that, that brings people up to speed for those world-class universities, all of that. Coming up next, for China to achieve high-quality growth, the role of the private sector can never be underestimated. What are the challenges the private sector faces? What are the causes and potential solutions? I speak with David Dollar, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington. What difficulties do private and micro enterprises face in their development? Yeah, so one of the big ones is access to finance. And, and this is true everywhere, so China's not that different. If you look at the lending from the banks, tends to go to big state enterprises. If you add, talk to the banks, they'll say, well, big state enterprise is a safe client. You know, they start lending to some very small private firm that has an idea. You know, you're taking a bet on whether that's a good idea or not. It turns out to be a bad idea. The firm goes bankrupt and the, and the bank essentially loses the money that it lent. So you always have this challenge. A uh, couple ways to get around it. Um, there are things you can do on the regulatory front really encourage banks to lend to small and medium firms. Uh, you now have that new stock market that's aimed at uh, the high-tech firms in China. Some of those are very big, of course, but that's an opportunity for some small firms to come in. So, so letting the stock market uh, be open to some of these small firms as they succeed, developing what we call venture capital. The challenge here is that the banks usually assess the credit risks by looking at one of the three things. Either you have a very complete set of historical data, mm -hmm. or you have fixed assets, right. which can be served as collaterals, and or, or if you have some implicit guarantee for them from the government, then the banks are willing to lend you money. Unfortunately, all three of those small companies don't have. The small <laughs> SMEs and the private enterprises don't have any of these. That is why, so I don't blame the banks per se, no, of course that not. they can't extend the loans to these SMEs because for banks, banks um, in order for them to extend the loans, they, you need to control risks. You can't just recklessly sure. extend the loans. Yeah, and they have pressure today because the financial risk is True. one of the, the three True. big battles that Xi Jinping talked about. And so they're under pressure to, to reduce their risk and, and right. non-performing loans, etc. So they're, they're really given contradictory kinds mm. of uh, uh, objectives. On the one hand, support innovation. Right. On the other hand, reduce your financial risk. True. <laughs> True. Well, that's right. Um, so on the one hand, financial institutions need to find ways to assess credit risks mm. of this new group of yeah. companies yeah. which are vital for innovation-driven growth. The second problem we're also facing now is interest rate is not entirely market-based. And so the banks actually face difficulties in lending to the SMEs if they can't substantially, significantly raise the lending rates. Yes, of course. Um, so I think we need to change on both fronts. Number one, to find effective ways for the banks in dealing with the risks of the small, medium companies. And number two, we also need to push through what really the last steps of interest rate liberalization. Mm. Despite the growth of China's private sector, challenges remain, primarily financing. In 2015, Alibaba and its affiliate, Ant Financial, launched MyBank, a new online bank. MyBank, offering loans, is dedicated to providing inclusive and innovative financial solutions for individuals and for small and micro enterprises in both urban and rural areas. 
Mr. Yang from Zhejiang Province ran an online shop on Taobao selling sweet potatoes. In 2015, two years after starting his business, he borrowed a total of over 600,000 yuan from my bank, which helped address the financing of his business. At a traditional bank, it takes at least one month to get a loan. There are verification and guarantee requirements. At my bank, the funds may come into the account one minute after submitting the online application. Based on big data and cloud computing, my bank has provided microloans totaling over 2 trillion yuan, that's 290 billion US dollars, to over 15 million small and micro enterprises and entrepreneurs in China by June 2019. What benefits would financial innovation and transformation bring to private enterprises, small and micro enterprises? Actually, that's a great question because you already see a lot of this in China. Mm -hmm. You know, China's had a lot of fintech development, so you've got people paying for things on their phones now, and they're, they're leapfrogging credit cards in many ways. You, know, you can go on your phone to these, uh, these essentially online banks, uh, and you can get loans and you can make deposits, all of that, you know, that's very helpful. So for small and medium firms, I think these fintech developments create opportunities to borrow money and to make payments in a very efficient way. Big data online, online big data. So you don't have a fixed asset, you don't have a historical, historical data, but if, I know, if you have enough digital footprints, I can try to assess your risk and try to make a, make, make a loan. And so we have, at the moment, we have three online banks, these new kind of banks. Um, the, uh, the, the My Bank in uh, Hangzhou mm -hmm. is affiliated to the End Financial. The, the We Bank um, in uh, Shenzhen affiliated to Tencent. And there's another new bank in uh, Chengdu called XW Bank, mm. affiliated to um, the New Hope company and uh, Xiaomi. Um, all three, uh, three online banks do business slightly differently, but the, 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 the central piece of risk assessment is the same. Basically, look at your digital footprint um, and extend loans directly online. And then nowadays, each of these three banks has something like between 1,000 to 2,000 staff in their single mm. office, headquarter office, mm. because it's an online bank. Yeah. They only have one office. But each of them is extending more than 10 million loans today. Wow. Mm. Every year, mm. every year. Mm. That's remarkable. What impact will the reform and transformation of China's financial system have on the internationalization of China's currency, the RMB? I, uh, I think this financial reform in China is really the foundation of internationalization of the RMB. You know, the government started promoting international of the RMB a number of years ago, and it seemed to be taking off very quickly. You know, the China's share of global payments that are in RMB increased very quickly, but starting very close to zero, it went from about zero to about two percent of world transactions very quickly. But it's stagnated over the last five years or so. And I think you know, the world is basically looking at China to see more thorough reform of the financial system. Again, I think this is pretty simple. And the solution is to gradually uh, open up so that money can move in more easily. Well, I think it will rise quite significantly. Um, but obviously, we'll still have significant hurdles to overcome for RMB to play a much, much more uh, a prominent role in the international market. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the exchange rates need to be a lot more flexible. The, um, the capital markets need to be a lot more open. But there are also a lot of many questions about our legal system, our information, the, the free flow of mm -hmm. information, and so on. These are all very important for um, the, 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 the financial decision. So, so I think it will on the way, uh, rise, but I would not, uh, um, in, the, in the perceivable future, uh, predict a significant role. For China to achieve its overarching goal for China 2049, what are the primary challenges for China's financial system? Right, so I think that, uh, that's a big question. Yeah, I think one of the 
first challenge is, is to avoid having a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, financial reform is difficult. Financial opening is difficult. I've never encouraged China to just move ahead blindly with opening up its whole financial system because there are risks. So managing things so there's no banking crisis in China, I think that's the number one priority because that would have a devastating effect on China and the rest of the world. The first thing you find is uh, policy coordination is relatively weak. Um, different uh, um, institutions uh, responsible for different areas, but the, the, the exchange of information and the coordination of a policy is relatively weak. This is why we didn't have a good regulation on shadow banking. Mm -hmm. And uh, stock investors borrowing from the banks uh, sometimes not everybody uh, was aware of it. So these things need to change. But fortunately now we have a State Council Financial Stability Development uh, Commission. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have, uh, there is a significant, important need to upgrade our regulatory capability. Right. But looking back at the reason why we didn't have any systemic financial crisis, was because of mainly two reasons. Number one was sustained rapid economic growth. When the economy mm. is expanding so rapidly for all so long, all problems yeah, right. can be absorbed. Right, right. The second reason was because of the implicit government guarantee. The reason why recently we are seeing more risks now is because both of these factors are gradually weakening. Growth is slowing down. The government can't guarantee everything. And so I think the risks start to rise. But the, the regulators, I think they need to improve their capability significantly. Mm. The stock market, as you probably know, um, we've been doing it for almost 30 years. And I must say the quality of the capital market is really not up to standard. China must transform its financial system and markets to support innovation in the real economy which is essential for China's continuing economic development. Key is innovation in finance. New financial institutions are essential, leveraging China's state-of-the-art e-commerce. How to encourage innovation while mitigating risks may require a new breed of regulators. While China will continue to develop its financial system, it is unrealistic to expect U.S. or U.K. markets overnight. Banks will continue to be the major source of financing enterprises, but if banks can adopt big data methods, they can modernize their analysis of credit worthiness, especially of small and medium-sized companies which generate innovation. FinTech institutions exemplify data-driven, inclusive finance. Critical is China's unprecedented commitment to open up its finance industry to foreign companies, encouraging competition to improve customer service. Trends are clear. China Finance will continue to integrate into world markets and continue to promote RMB internationalization. But forecasting 2049 by projecting 2020, that's risky business. One must be ever vigilant to be closer to China.